Hello everybody, um, welcome to Daily Coaching. Um, Daily Coaching are currently hosting a number of online recorded discussions um, about various topics within the football industry. Um, and today's topic which we're going to be discussing is all around the community um, and leading up into the professional game sort of within the conference level and, and beyond that as well. Um, and I'm really excited to announce that the um, guest that we have speaking with us today is Anthony Limbrick, um, who is currently the Grimsby Town Assistant Manager. Um, and we're just gonna kind of discuss around his previous experiences, his background, um, and then looking at around some of those key points around community coaching versus coaching at more professional level. Um, so kind of cracking straight on with things. Um, obviously, first of all, I'd like to give Anthony a big welcome. Um, and Anthony, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us some of your backgrounds and experiences kind of from where you started um, and then leading us up to kind of yeah. where you're at now. Sure. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So looking forward to it. Um, I mean, probably in my own sort of coaching um, history, I probably had a bit of a different pathway compared to most people, um, if I'm honest. Um, I, come, I was born in Australia, as you can tell by the accent, and um, when I had the dream of coming to the England and UK and being a professional footballer and trained most of my life to do that, came over at 18, 19, and got here and realised I wasn't a very good player. I was very hard when I come here. I found it so difficult. The game was very physical compared to in Australia, where it was a lot more technical and you could, you could have more tricks and skills, whereas here it was physical, the tempo was hard, and I found it really difficult. And I trialled at a lot of clubs, England, Scotland, Wales, and, and ended up breaking my leg, and I could still come back and play, but I realised at the time, once I'd broken my leg, that I wouldn't be a professional footballer. So that was probably my whole dream, sort of um, put on the back burner, or, or, or not knew that I wouldn't make it as a footballer at sort of 19. So I was like, well, what am I going to do now? So I pretty much decided within a couple of days I was going to become a professional football coach. And what I, yeah, it was strange at the time. There was a lot of people from Australia saying, look, you need to move back home. My family, my friends, everyone. Because it was tough when I was over here. I wasn't working. I had no money. It was, it was a very difficult situation. But I was pretty determined to probably try and fulfill my dream of being a football coach that I couldn't have as a footballer. Um, I could still come back and play, but I don't know why. I just realised I'd never be, a, never be a player. But one thing I did realise was, though, that all the things I'd done as a player, I think, was preparing me as a coach without really knowing it. So I'd like, I was a left back, not a very good one, but I was a left back. And I thought, I thought I'm going to study other left backs and then learn the role of fullback. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to learn the role of a wide player because then I'll know what they're going to do against me as yeah. a fullback. Then I thought, I've got to know about strength and conditioning and diet. And I'd study the top players and, and work out what managers wanted. And I think by having so many knockbacks and setbacks as a player and trialling and getting knocked back and not making it, I was exposed to a lot of managers, a lot of good ones and a lot of bad ones at the same time and seen a lot of different players at a lot of different levels. And I think that all of those things prepared me for when it was time to become a coach. I thought, oh, yeah, I could actually coach here. So... That was sort of how I fell into coaching, sort of 18, 19, going, well, yeah. all right, how am I going to do it and, and what am I going to do? And I had the dream of being a professional coach and coaching in the Football League and, and, and going from there. And that was many years ago now, about 15, 16 years ago. This could be 17 years ago now, I think about it. So it was a long time ago and been a long journey since then. But that was sort of how I first started out um, in coaching. Uh, my first job was a... Um, job at a not-for-profit organization called active planet in west london okay. so we would go around um schools do after school clubs i'd go into um primary schools and do their ppa time we go on to some of the roughest estates like in london and teach their lads futsal which was a really eye-opening experience of all different ages with with real sort of underprivileged i'd say families and areas like some rough neighborhoods but we never had a problem because they would just love the football so one minute I could be coaching a a fairly affluent kid in in year three in the park in Kensington and Chelsea and then the next minute on Labro Grove Estate coaching um, 17, 18 year olds who, who weren't going to school. So that sort of gave me a real overview or, or a tough time of how to coach and how to manage people and I was there were times when I was thinking oh, wow this is this is tough I'm not sure this is going to be for me because it was so difficult to adapt and then the club I was at at the moment at the time the semi-professional club Wingate and Finchley they were in the Ryman Division 1 North they needed a reserve team coach so I took that job at about sort of 22, 23 um, that was an experience as well then the first team coach left so I went and assisted as the first team coach at, at the same age and they were some tough coaching times as well because you had um, sort of 30 year old ex-pros who dropped back into non-league who knew a lot more about the game with me a lot more experience and they were I guess looking at this Australian young kid who didn't really know what he was doing, saying, well, why are we going to listen to him for? So that, that was a, a good experience at the time. So 
in a typical day, I could have, and I'll, I'll lead on to this in a minute, I'm sure with the follow-up questions you'll ask, but I could be coaching a, a year three class in the morning. Then in the afternoon, I'm working with state kids, 17, 18 years old. Then I could be doing an after-school club with a totally different type of kids and then going and coaching a senior men's team at night. So without really realising at the time, I was getting exposed to just so many different ages, so many different levels, so many different varieties and had to adapt and change my coaching all around there. So I think at the time it was tough. The money wasn't great. Um, they were my only two jobs at the time. I was struggling to live and survive in London, as I'm sure most coaches could um, associate with. It's difficult when you first start out. And I had many, many years like that. And I think that's tough. But I was very determined to hang in there and, and get through and try and push on and push on from there. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's a couple of things I picked up on there. So the, obviously the first thing where you mentioned sort of about the, um, when you was playing, um, and it kind of, you feel it led you up to sort of becoming a coach. I think um, a lot of times when I'm talking to coaches and saying that, you know, if you're sort of um, educating your players to uh, have a game understanding um, and be, they become sort of decision makers, then that's kind of what we're doing really as coaches. We're, we're potentially creating the next batch of coaches because, you know, like you said, if you have course, that yeah. football understanding, especially, again, you use the scenario of, you know, whichever position you're playing in, even if you're a defender, then yeah, you've got to learn the and understand the principles and, and the, the thinking and the uh, decision making in which the attacker might make. So obviously you can intervene with that okay, and you yeah. can uh, prevent that. So yeah, so that was that was really interesting and what I picked up on there. Um, as well, the other thing, like you said, a lot of coaches, they do, I think they get the impression that it's you know, working within potentially primary schools with very young age groups, with a real mixture of groups, uh, or individuals, should I say, um, and it's that feeling of they kind of feel sometimes though this is hard work, um, depending upon mm -hmm. the characters that they've got, um, and also depending upon the sort of I suppose long term vision in which they see themselves going at. So interesting uh, your point yeah. there about you know especially when you do start out first of all within football coaching there isn't a lot of money within it, so you almost have to do a few roles at the same time. Um, and I think it's I'm crucial definitely. what you mentioned there about the you know you're getting the daytime experience of working with like you said children of mixed age groups, mixed abilities, um, different characters as well. And then you obviously move into the aspect of you're working with players who, like you said, at the time might be older, potentially might be perceived as thinking that they know more because they've been playing the game potentially for longer or at a higher level as well. So um, interesting on that point. Um, kind of look at the sort of two, two aspects of it then. So obviously you started to go into um, sort of more of the um, elite game, if we want to call it that, when you started um, obviously as the um, assistant and then went into the, the first team role of your first club that you was at. Um, how did you kind of feel that the uh, sort of challenge of making sure that those players who, with the more experience, were sort of understanding what you wanted to get out of them and that, you know, honestly, you was the right person for the job, but you was going to be able to, almost like you was doing during the day, impacting the children's learning, the children's understanding, but how are you sort of mm. going to try and put it in place that it's going to impact the, the players' understanding? The players so I'm glad I had that experience, yeah, that experience when I was young because it really taught me a lot and I still use it now. So I think that a lot of the jobs that I've gone for and got have always been too young, too inexperienced, not enough qualifications, too Australian sometimes as well. Um, so it's been, I've always been challenged with that. And a lot of people I'm sure have looked at me in jobs and gone, oh, geez, I'm not sure he's ready for that. But that's really motivated me to be, I think you've got to be better at what you do. So I knew I had to be a better communicator when I went into that job, even then and I had to put on better sessions. I had to understand the players and I had to get in with the, with the older, the top five people in the group, like who were the dominant figures in the group? How would I get them on side? I'd pull them separately, maybe give them a call in the week. Say, look, how do you feel things are going? What do you want from training? Giving them a lot of player ownership and then still be my own man as well. But if I was going to make any big decisions when it came to training or I wasn't sure about something, I would run it through sometimes the older players to get them on side. Now, that's not to say they ran training at all. I was in charge and I took it with the manager who didn't make as much of training at the time. But I think that was important and that taught me quite early on and something I still do now is that you, you've got to make sure you understand the person first. I know it's a bit of a cliche at the moment with coaching badges and stuff, but... It really is true. If, if you can get them on side and get them believing what you, you're doing, then I think you can win them over to go and deliver. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, as well as after that, when I finished the job at the, um, the, the like doing the after schools clubs and that, I went and worked at Borenwood Football Club on their college scheme, okay. which was great because I was able to work with 11 to 11 football every day of the week. Um, and then that led into the senior men's training of a night. Then after that, I went to 
um, the skills program, which I know you know a lot about, David, as well. Yeah. And that was an excellent education for me because I thought I knew a lot about football, but I didn't understand enough about learning and children and how to impact that. So I knew a lot about football, but I didn't know how to impart it. And I got great coach education when I was on there. I did my A license um, at the same time, which I really enjoyed at the time and got a lot from, to be fair. I felt like all the badges came at a good time for me. We did our, I think we were the first ones to do the Advanced Youth Award. Then it was like Module 1, 2 and 3. Yeah. And we did those well with the skills program. So I was, I've been quite fortunate with the jobs I've had. I've been able to learn at the right time along the way. So I was getting that education of pedagogy and learning and challenging and that sort of thing. And then learning with the senior men in the afternoon. So I, I, I was a big believer that no matter what session you're in, whether you're taking three-year-olds, 10-year-olds, academy players, first-team players women's football, disabled football, whatever it is, you've got to do a couple of things. You've got to motivate the players. They've got to enjoy the session and you want to teach them something in there. Now that looks different to a semi-pro player playing part-time for £100 a week or a England international in the under-17s or a kid who's in the after-schools program. The, thing, the, the principles for me still apply. You've just got to adapt your coaching and your behaviours and your communication to fit that. So I've all, just leading back to your other question, I've always tried to do that as much as I can in those sessions whatever the session is to try and motivate those players to go and go and enjoy it and deliver so i think that was that was i think because one of the reasons which has helped me was because i've had that such variety of coaching and i think that you've got to be treating that session with children in a classroom as if it's as important as you're prepping for a game on the saturday and you're in the champions league final for instance yeah. because it, because they are as important you might be motivating that one kid to improve and develop to get better to then fall in love with the game and, and vice versa at the other end of it. So I worked out quite early on that I'd treat every session as important as the other, and I never tried to differentiate between the two. So I'd prep and plan and deliver and evaluate the, the same, but behaving obviously different with the different age groups. Yeah, totally. I think, it's, again, the FA kind of put a big emphasis on this whole plan, do, review process. And I think, like you said, it's, it's crucial for people to do because I think often, again, you know, sometimes as coaches, we kind of have so many sessions within our head um, and kind of like you touched on, um, you know, it's making it relevant and making it appropriate to the individuals which we have in front of us. Um, and I think you're right about the whole thing where, you know, a lot of the time it is, it's about the individual and it's about the person. So I know that before I've used sessions, which, you know, might work on a five-year-old, but also may work on an 18-year-old. But exactly. it's again, adapting it and making it appropriate to what the deliverable outcomes are um, and what the desired outcomes are for the individual as well, um, which, which, is, which is massive. Um, well, I learned a lot of a guy called, um, just quickly off um, yeah. one of our team leaders in the FA Schools program called Kevin Green, who, who you know, yeah. um, who's working on the, the coach mentoring as a, as a national, what, what's he doing now, Kevin? Uh, so he's, he's now working for the, um, as part of the London FA and he's the London County Coach Developer, so overseeing all the That's coach right. education within London. I hope he doesn't watch that because I speak to him regularly, so I should really know what role he's doing, so I'm hoping he doesn't see this. But um, he, yeah, he was very good at the time. We've taught, we've, um, taught me a lot about challenging people in the sessions and really evaluating what you're doing and working with a structure and a framework in the session, but not to be too rigid with it and, and delivering what the players need in the session and your plans may waver and change. And you might have three progressions in a particular practice, but you don't get, you only get through two, but then you add another one, but then you change it because it's not working or different players need different challenges. So he was very good at, at that sort of thing. And I learned a lot from that and still use it, use a lot that he said today. I think as well, just on that point is, you know, sometimes it's the young sung heroes. I mean, you know, a lot of the time we'll look at people potentially like, you know, the top coaches and managers in the world and we'll think, you know, what are they doing? How can I, how can I sort of, um, duplicate what they're doing on, on, on the field and with their players. But like you just kind of said, I think it's sometimes, especially somebody like Kevin Green, who has a great understanding of children, of learning, of education. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's taking those experiences. Because like you just said, you've obviously done a range of different roles within football, obviously leading you up to the point where you took your first sort of role as a, as a manager of a, of, of a men's team. Um, but it's, yeah, how do you kind of, which I think is important for most coaches to know and understand as well, of when they're going into these roles or these these teams or... Um, even like you said, these settings um, from an early stage where they're working with uh, children, it's what can the company also offer them as well in terms of you know what can they learn from the people around them? Because I think that that's massive, and especially in this world of social media nowadays. You know, there's so much learning opportunities out there, and and people which are willing to give, um, you know, even just be talks or or things like that. So. Yeah, I think it's massive. Um, so kind of leading on from there, then, what was, what kind of was the process? What happened after that? So you've obviously taken your first um, role as a, as, a, as a men's team's manager. Um, like you said, it was first with that initial battle of trying to get the uh, 
older players or more senior players on board. Um, obviously, like you said, you spoke about how you how you managed to overcome that I say problem, but that that first initial challenge which mm-hmm. which came across. Um, and then what kind of process there to sort of pushing you on where yeah, you I mean, it, to get to. Yeah, it was a difficult one because I come to a bit of a crossroads really because I knew I needed to, um, I've always been quite ambitious and wanted to yeah. improve and, and push myself and wanted to work as high as I could. So it was kind of like, what pathway did I go down? I'd, I'd managed to complete the A licence. I think I was 27 at the time. So I got that qualification. I was really ready to test myself in the next level. And I'd never really worked with that many academy players before. And I thought yeah. that could be a good pathway into learning more first and foremost and being able to secure the one job at the one place to be able to put all my effort and work into that. I think as a coach, sometimes I speak to a lot of coaches and I did it for years, as I just said, that you work a little bit at this job, then you go here, then you do this one. And it was time for me really to bed down in the one place and really just focus and concentrate on the one thing. So I applied for the job at Southampton Football Club. Um, Again, I was fortunate that it was a good timing for me because they, were in, they just got relegated to League One at the time. There was a guy there called Les Reed, who was from Charlton in the FA, and he'd just come in as football um, like technical director. And he, force, he, he, I think, advised the Premier League on what was going to happen with the E-Triple-P. So he was one step ahead. So he hired a full-time 14s coach, a full-time 18s coach, a full-time 16 coach, and I applied for the full-time 14s job and, and managed to get that job. Um, there weren't many full-time 14s coaches at League One clubs then. Obviously, I knew that Southampton would be on a sort of an upward trajectory and wanted to get back in the Premier League. And when the categories came out with the Triple P, they wanted to be Category 1. So I thought it was going to be a great move for me. I went down there and had five great years. And especially the first year was great because we'd take the under-14s at night. So we'd train like 7 till 9 or 6.30 till 8.30, whatever it was. But then I'd have a, a, a another go in the other age groups, might be taking the 12s or the 13s. And then during the day, I'd assist the under-18s coach, which was Jason Dodd at the time, or Martin Hunter, which was the under-23s coach. And we had some unbelievable players in that age group. I think at under-16s at the time who were training with the 18s was like Luke Shaw, James Ward-Prowse, Callum Chambers, all that sort of group that I got to see good coaches work with. I got to coach them myself as well because I was assisting. So we'd split into attackers, midfielders, defenders in groups. And I got to see really top quality players of all different age groups um, come through with the system. And I was so, so fortunate that I had that education. I did that for two years. Then I managed to take the under 16s job and become the lead phase 13s to 16s coach. And then had my final season there. The fifth year was um, as under 18s coach, youth team coach. So I had a really good progression through the system there and a lot of good coaches and was managed to watch a lot of good first team managers. Um, deliver and work and and speak to them so yeah that club was great for me I learned so so much about player development and working with elite players and had so many good coaches and people to work with we had um, Matt Crocker the academy manager there who's gone on to work with with England's now gone back to Southampton we had Martin Hunter Les Reed as I said Um, Jason Dobb was there another guy Steve Greaves was a good coach was at Ipswich for many years and I was really fortunate you talk about working with good people and, and worked with great people there and that gave me a a real, a real understanding of, of young player development and, and managed to see some good players come through um, in the system. So that, that was, yeah, that was a good five years for my, for my career. It's interesting as well, because obviously, you know, you said obviously before around the, uh, you know, working within the schools and going obviously into sort of the uh, college uh, age group as well. And then obviously the men's age group, I suppose it's very similar in that sense of, I mean, obviously, again, the perceived more elite and more um, advanced players potentially with their technical ability, obviously at Southampton, but it's again, it's working with those similar age groups and you're progressing obviously throughout those ages. So again, I suppose, you know, using your previous experience, you're able to implement something similar. Um, but I was just going to touch on something. So again, a lot of coaches, obviously, you know, they are highly motivated. They want to try and progress on um, within their careers and get obviously to certain stages or particular areas um, within, within the game. Um, was there ever a sort of, not necessarily a doubt, but was there a sort of a, a question in your mind of, do I stay at a set time or a set area or, uh, in terms of age groups for a particular time? Um, and then really kind of, I don't know, if you want to call it master that age group and then move on? Or is it a sort of thing of, you know, you thought to yourself, because okay, again, you speak of you being highly ambitious and, you know, sometimes you have got to take the opportunities when they're, when they're given to you. Was it a sort of thing mm. of, look, do you know what? Yeah. Just give it a go. <laughs> It's a hard question to answer because I think everyone's different, but I think a little bit of both. So I always knew what I wanted to do long term in the end. Um, And I always knew that what I wanted to do was I wanted to make sure I was planned and prepared as ready as I could. So when those eventualities came in any 
in any throughout my age groups or work or jobs that I was always ready to deliver and go. So I never necessarily said, right, I'm going to do two years at the 14s, two years at the 16s, then go to the 18s. It was however long it took yeah. and when the opportunity came. And I think just making sure that whenever I went into the clubs, I went into Southampton, I made sure that I was a hard worker. I mean, I was reliable. I'd help people out. Um, I mean, we'd get in at sort of 7.30, 8 o'clock. We'd leave at 8 or 9 o'clock every day because you need your coach through the day. You do the 18s, 23s in the morning. Then you might do the day release or the afternoon sessions. Then you do the nighttime sessions. We're coaching three or four times a day. So just making sure that you're reliable. And it's amazing when you're reliable and you work hard and people trust you. Just like when you're a manager and you want to trust the players, you put them in the team to deliver. Bosses at clubs, academy managers, people there, when you're reliable, you deliver, you help out, you, you, you work hard, then you'll get promoted in those clubs, I think. And if not, then there comes times when you have to leave clubs, which, which I've done as well. But I don't think there's a, a necessarily a, a, I'd set myself um, a time frame on each sort of age group, but I just knew that I wanted to keep progressing and keep improving and just making sure that when the opportunities and the chances come that I nailed them and, and, and worked hard with them. And that's probably what happened when, when I stepped up to the 18s. I got to do that job and, and that was good, but it was a, it was a, a full on five years worth of coaching and, and progressing while, while I was there and really important time in my career. I mean, after that, I um, went back to Australia for a little bit, come back over to England and similar thing, got a little small opportunity with the England under-17 team as an assistant manager for um, a couple of weeks as, or sorry, an assistant coach really, um, with the under-17 age group. We played two games against Germany and that again was great experience to see even more elite players and compare them to the players that I'd worked with. It was the 1999 age group. So that was good to see another country work and prep for an international game. They're only friendlies, but it was a great experience to do that too. So I learned plenty from that. And then I was out of work from, and it was the first time I'd been out of work really for, for a long time. I was out of work from about, that happened around the Christmas time, but I hadn't really had a full-time job since I left Southampton in about July. And then I went back in at West Ham in the academy with the 15s, 16s, mainly with the 15s, assisting the 16s coach in probably February the, the year after that. So like I had about six months out. And that was a really interesting time because it gave me a, a proper time to evaluate and and work out what I'd learned because it was just so busy going in and out. And I must have applied for, I think I wrote it down, maybe 35 jobs in that time from when I left Southampton to when I got the job at West Ham yeah. and got turned back, got knocked back, not qualified enough, don't really fancy you, we've already got someone else for the job. Um, all, all, those, all those things that you have those conversations, it wasn't enough money or it was in wasn't the right club and things like that. And I think I counted there about 35. So I think a big part or a big message I would say would be that in coaching, you're just going to get a knockback after knockback and setback after setback. And I'm pretty sure that's how my whole career is, has gone and will go as well. And no one really teaches you as a coach how to deal with those things. I just think you've got to learn how to do it yourself because it sounds great. I oh, 35 jobs, but at the time I had no job, no income. I think I, my wife and I were getting married at the end of that year. We had a wedding to pay for. I was starting to get older. So I had more responsibilities. It was tougher. It was a lot easier when, uh, when you were earning less money many, yeah. many years ago in the early start of the coaching. But so those things all came into it as well, but I was very determined to make sure I stayed in the game. There was no doubt I was ever going to, ever going to leave. I was going to become a coach. That's what I had been. I'd worked so hard all those years to get, qualifications and the level to go up and I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity at West Ham with some good coaches there we had Terry Wesley the academy manager very good coach learned a lot from him and Liam Manning was there as well um, Steve Potts there's some good coaches there and seeing the academy kids in London and I'd lived in London my wife's from London um, compared to the Southampton kids were very different and, and both had different attributes and good attributes of London lads were very physical and really aggressive and you'd have kids catching three tubes to training with a Tesco's yeah. bag with their boots in it. Whereas Southampton was very, everyone would turn up in their nice cars and they deliver and the kids were a bit nice, but they were technically good and very clever and intelligent. So that was a good challenge for me really to work with those kids and enjoyed that Two very different academies, but learned plenty at the time. And I did that for a couple of years doing the 15s. And then I applied for the pro license. I thought I'd always wanted to get on the pro license. I wanted to be the youngest Australian to get a pro license. Um, I, th I think I am or, or have been in the, the UEFA pro license, the English one. Yeah. And then I applied and I thought I'll apply and then it'll probably take me a couple of years to get on the course because you had to go through this um, qualification process. And I thought, oh, that's good because it's not just the ex-pros who, who go on. 
um, anymore. It's, it's, but you had, I think you had a certain amount of managers went on, a certain amount of youth developers, a certain amount of um, first team coaches and ex-professionals as well. I went through this like two or three day rigorous process. And I thought that was a great experience. It was really tough and hard and you had to deliver in front of the group and you had really good ex-pros or managers in the groups with you. I'm thinking, oh, what a good experience. I'm probably, yeah. I'll probably get on this course three or four years time. And I managed to get on that course straight away. So I was very, very um, fortunate there and enjoyed it and was lucky to get on the course. So I thought once I got on that, I was doing the pro license and thought, right, I might use this if the opportunity comes up to get into first team football. And that ended up happening at Woking Football Club. Yeah. Um, so um, just before I kind of touch on that, um, going back a little, a little bit. Um, so you obviously mentioned about you obviously had the six month uh, period out before you obviously went down now. I think like you said, this is a common theme which a lot of coaches come across, um, whether it be in terms of uh, financial income. So they're looking for obviously more opportunities where they're going to get more money, um, whether it yeah. be in terms of they're just doing jobs here and there and they're kind of thinking about, you know, um, whether it be actually little things such as the environment so if it rains all of a sudden a session gets cancelled and yeah, they can yeah. no longer do that session so um was there any points i know you obviously kind of touched on it briefly but was there any points where you kind of thought look i know you said obviously you, you put so much time and so much effort into into football and, and also probably some probably a lot of uh, investment into football as well um but you know mm -hmm. was there a point where it got to where you kind of thought well, you know, am i going to continue with this um or was it just a pure continuation of look you know what I'm gonna yeah no i always knew i would continue it because i think i'd had all those really really tough times financially yeah. and everything when i was a lot younger so when i first started coaching at like You've 20 21 and 22 and then once I'd got through those years, I felt with the qualifications I had and the background I'd had working at Southampton and, and that sort of thing that I would get another job somewhere. But it was a testing time because you, once you got to a certain level and then lost your job and then ended up without a job, it's hard mentally to deal with because you're used to being busy every day. You're flat out coaching. You've got something to look forward to. You're doing it all the time. And then suddenly there's a huge gap where you're not coaching at all. So I think learning how to manage that time and I tried to make the most of it and evaluate it and got my sessions together and really sort of um, had a good look at what I'd done, what I'd learned, what I was going to use taking forward and how I could become a better coach for it. But in terms of, no, I was, I was never going to give up. I was always going to keep going. I think probably because I'd come all the way over from Australia and was quite um, determined to prove that, first of all, people who hadn't played the game could coach yep. um, and could make it in the professional game. Australians could do it as well because there's not really – any or well, there are not many Australian coaches who had not been professionals who are now yeah. coaching. So I think with those two factors in mind, I was always quite determined. And I think because I didn't make it as a player and put so much effort into that, I'd be crazy if I just went and got a, a normal job or, Stop, or yeah. and, and not kept going. So for me, it was quite an easy decision and not really a decision that I ever thought about because I just kept going and pushing and just knew eventually that I'd, that I'd find a way, really. That didn't mean that it was easy yeah. <laughs> by any means. It was very difficult and very tough, and there were some really tough times, of course, but I think those tough times definitely help you and, and improve you as a coach. And when, when things you think are tougher uh, in your job, they're probably not as tough compared to what you've already been through. So I think once I've been through those moments, there was no doubt I was going to continue on. Yeah, of course. Um, and as well, uh, just briefly touching on the, um, like I said, you're obviously going back into West Ham, obviously working within the sort of London London boroughs. Um, and there's often a thing which I use where I say that, you know, sometimes within a footballer, you need a bit of a mixture of talent, motivation and opportunity. So obviously you know, a lot of the time clubs are looking for talented players, whatever you may perceive talent to be as. Um, the players have got to have their own motivations. And like you said, opportunities, because I'm, you know, I totally uh, agree with what you're saying there about there's some players who, like you said, are having to travel you know, quite a long distance by themselves, not got the opportunity of parents or um, people being able yeah. to bring them across sessions. Um, so it's interesting you, you make that point there. So then obviously, kind of like you said, you went into um, the Woking position um, and I suppose not vastly different in the sense of you had been able to do um, previous men's football before um, and obviously as well, you worked with um, you know, elite or a very good standard of players at um, West Ham and also Southampton. But obviously, mm -hmm. like you said, now, it's all in the power's all in your hands to that extent where it's you're basically you're, you're mm. running the club you're bringing in the players what kind of how did that sort of change your or if it did change your mentality of you know the coach versus the manager because yeah of course i mean first of all it was a big it was a big risk going into that because yeah. i had a settled stable job at west ham that was just down the road i lived in east london yeah. to then going into a job where you lose six games in a row and you could be out uh, 
but I knew that I wanted that challenge to, I really wanted to try and prove if you could develop players, but then also win games in a first team environment as well. And I looked up to a lot of other coaches who I was fortunate enough to watch a lot of um, uh, Pochettino at Southampton. We had Kuma there, we had Nigel Adkins, who I still speak to regularly now. And they were all developers of players, but then also very successful managers in their own right as well. And I always saw myself more as a head coach as opposed to a manager who just stepped back not coach or be on the grass, whereas I knew that I would take all the sessions, do all the technical work, deliver the meetings in terms of the videos, etc. And I was determined I wasn't going to change my philosophy because I think there's a really good coach out there, Michael Beale, who's at Rangers at the moment, and I, I try and pick his brains whenever I can because he's very good. We used to coach against each other at Chelsea and then Liverpool, and I've tried to keep in contact with him, and he's such a good deliverer that he once said that once you're all, once you're a developer, you're always a developer, and I really think that's true. So. But I, but I wanted to make sure that I was successful in one games too. So it was quite a balancing act. Also, I was going in to work with players of non, no disrespect at the National League level who were, were full-time. Or we took the club woken from part-time training in the evening to then training three mornings a week. So it was virtually full-time. But I had to organise things like the travel to games myself, the hotels. I had to do the – I had to go and source a training ground. Um, I had to go and buy, get staff in. We had to go and manage staff. We had to do the recruitment. I brought a guy in to help me with the recruitment because I felt that was really important. And I made sure that I'd got everything in place so then I could deliver what I delivered the best, which was the coaching and the football. And what I found early on at Woking was the least of my problems was the actual football part. It was more about the managing the board, uh, managing the finances of the club, managing the players, and, and and then getting three points on the Saturday as well. You had to manage the media, something I hadn't really done that much before, and the media is obviously very important. So there were a lot of different challenges, but ones I really, really enjoyed. It was a, a proper challenge, and the buzz of getting three points on the Saturday was, was really big, and I very much enjoyed that. But then also seeing players develop. Um, we had a lad called Joe Ward who we sold in January to Peterborough, um, for a six-figure sum, and that was a, a really rewarding thing to see him develop. He'd come out of Brighton and um, was virtually like an academy player, and I sold him, look, come to us, work with us, we'll put you on an individual development plan, we'll do extra sessions with you, we'll show you the videos, we'll film training, which we did, and showed it back to him so he could improve, and, and we'll get your move into the Football League by the time your contract's finished, and that's how we sold it to him. So that was a lot of how our recruitment was done, getting players into Woking at that level. But then we had a sort of a mantra, we had these values of, of hard work, honesty, and one of them was ambition as well as respect, so respect for the club and everything. But the one ambition was that if you're just happy being in the National League, then I didn't want you in the team. So you had to be ambitious. I wanted to be a manager at higher level. Yeah. But we need to be respectful to the club we're at at the time and respect the fans and do the right thing. But you need to be ambitious. So that was how we sold it to the players. So that was very different doing recruitment and I'd have meetings with players and agents. And that was quite different because I hadn't really done any of that recruitment process before. But I wanted to make sure all that was in place so then I could like I said, do what I did best and deliver on the grass. And I was quite clear on how we were going to play and the formation we we're going to play. And I made sure that I didn't overcoach the players because I could have done too much. And I think maybe I did at times, but I tried to deliver quite clear, concise messages and make sure that I didn't overcoach because a lot of these players hadn't been coached properly before, which was quite a shock to me. Yeah. Some of the clubs they'd been at and players who had been in good football league clubs and come through good systems, come to us and didn't really understand basic principles and tactics. So that was quite quite an eye-opener for me, really, and I made sure I wasn't doing too much with them. But I really enjoyed the experience. We had a fantastic start to the season. Um, we were third in the league at one stage. We had a good FA Cup run. We, we beat Berry um, away from home 3 0 We were in League One at the time. We drew with Peterborough and took them to a replay. And then in January, we were, we were probably forced to sell a couple of our good players, which was which all clubs have to do sort of at that level. And we had a couple of key injuries and unfortunately just couldn't replace those players and spend the money that was required to, to get the right players in. And I thought I'd be able to get myself out of that and just stay in the league. But we, um, I got the sack on the first week of April. We were outside the relegation zone at the time, but the club after I left ended up getting relegated and they're now back in the National League. So obviously pleased for them, which is really good because there's a lot of good people there at Woking. They're brilliant and gave me my opportunity in the game. So I'll always be grateful to that. But that, that was certainly one of the best... Um, learning experiences getting the sack as a first-time manager and so early it was I didn't even see the season out from going from being third in the league to being linked to a lot of other jobs if I'm honest having the opportunity to go and move to other jobs but I didn't I stayed where I was 
And then all of a sudden, then in April, I think we hadn't won in nine games and then got relieved of my job there. So that was, yes, yeah, certainly a, a learning experience and, and one that was very different from academy football, that's for sure. And I'm not sure one that you can really plan or prepare for. Yeah. Um, when you're on the sideline in academies and it's a lot different, you're worrying about the football and the results don't matter as much. You're there based on and judged on developing players. Whereas when you then go into that first team football and your team's not playing well and your own fans are screaming at you, then no one can really prepare you for that moment. So I think that's probably one of the most underrated things of as a manager or someone who's going into first team football. How are you going to deal with the noise that's out there? The social media, the even at that level was, was amazing how much social media there was, the fans, the fans forums, the newspapers, things like that, which was quite interesting. One that I really enjoyed the challenge with, but one that I learned plenty from. So that was a good experience for me. And um, i never forget on my pro license course, we had um, Nigel Clough on there and he was great. He was the manager at Burton Albion at the time and, and still is. And when I got the sack, he was the first one who called me and it was a very brief conversation. He said, you okay? I went, yep. He went, you're never, you're never a proper manager until you get the sack. Give me a call if you need anything. All right, take care. Bye. And that was it. That was yep. the conversation, 10 seconds. And that was really all I needed. I was like, yeah, right. He's, he's very true. And, and until you get the sack, you, uh, you don't know what it's like. So it's been, uh, it's been interesting, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I think as well, we've, like, going back to the thing we were talking about earlier in terms of you know, players are like coaches and almost, almost preparing themselves as a player leading up to almost becoming coaches um, within the game it's that same experience I think you know a lot of the time a footballer's journey is never easy um, and a lot of the time as well footballers potentially may not get to the heights in which they want to get to and then they have a setback and then all of a sudden it takes one move or one position where they go into and then you know it generates some moving forwards um, so yeah. similar to like the manager's role it's, it, it's, it's that key thing and again kind of touching because I think this is one of the key things where obviously you've had that experience of um, educating and, and uh, learning or giving players learning tools to work with in terms of whether it be a young age group, the, the college age group, or even the academy stuff as well. I think sometimes this is not always lost with ex-professionals, but you know there can be that, that overlap of they've obviously played the game at a really high level, but where somebody like yourself, like you said, it's that experience of coming potentially maybe not from the pro game uh, background, but you've educated, you've developed, you've, you've given these players this learning. And it was it's really pleasing to hear that you stuck with that when you went into, mm. into that role as well. Um, and I know you and, worked and I had to, just quickly, players, I had you? to Yeah, I had to deliver it differently to different players. So the older yeah. players, I, I, I don't believe it that older players don't want to learn or get better because they do. They really yeah. do. Everybody wants to learn and get better. Even the player who's motivated just purely by money. Give yeah. me one of them all day long because... They want to learn and develop to improve, to get better, to go and deliver, to get free points, to get a new contract, to yeah. go and provide for their family. Who, who doesn't want to do that? Yeah. So like that wasn't a problem for me, but I always made sure that the staff was really important. So I got an ex-player to come in with me as my assistant at Woking. I had that support at Southampton with Raddy Jaidi and Graham Murdy, who, who helped assist me when you were there. Both ex-players as well, because they can add value where I possibly can't. So I think getting the balance of that is so important. But recruiting the right players who wanted to buy into my ideas and how we wanted to train and how we wanted to play was also important as well. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's, that's not at all. Again, I suppose it's an interesting point because when you're in those positions, you have that sort of flexibility to be able to do that, whereas potentially at an academy level, you're kind of just getting given the players, which potentially maybe not even yourself has identified as those players to no, come exactly. in in that age group. So, but then also I realised early on, just to follow on that point, yeah. was that recruitment wasn't really one of my strengths okay. and recruiting staff wasn't my strengths or those things. So I wanted to make sure that I delivered what I was good at yeah. and made sure other people could do that for me. So I always had the final say in recruitment of players, yeah. but I'd have people and scouts and stuff out there to help me do that and help deliver those things that I wasn't good at. I'm a big believer on that. You can learn about something all you like, but if you've done 15 years of coaching on the grass, that's what you're good at. Go and deliver what you're good at. Same with a player. Yeah. You can help improve their on their individual development plans, the bits they need work on. But the maximum thing, the one thing that they're really good at, or the two things or the three things, they're the things they've got to deliver consistently to go and have a career in the game. And I think it's the same with coaching. You can always upskill yourself and get better and improve. So I'm not saying ignore the bits that you're not good at. Keep chipping away at them and working on them, but keep delivering and practicing your strengths. Yeah, that makes make sense. Makes total sense. Um, so obviously, again, you come to this bit of a crossroads where it's, you know, you, you're no longer at Woking. Um, similar to the situation, I suppose, where you know you came back from Australia and then you're thinking, what's what's the next move? What was your your kind of approach in terms of uh, what do I do now? What kind of experience yeah. am I going to take on? And because obviously now 
you know, you've, you've had that major experience at, at a club. Um, and like you said, it was, you, know, you, you did very good work there in terms of the, the, the type of players you got in, the, the, the developing of the players from, you know, getting them in at potentially lower fees and then obviously selling them on. So, you know, like I said, there's a lot of uh, talk going around your name. So then what was kind of the next, next approach you took from there? Yeah, well, it was, um, it, it was to, to basically stay in professional football or yeah. full-time football because I felt like I needed more experience in it. And yeah. I'd had all those years in academy and younger developing football and a little bit of experience in non-league earlier on before that. So I wanted to make sure I stayed in full-time football in, in a variety of roles, whether that was other managers' roles. I went for interviews for other managers' jobs and got quite close. I went for other assistant managers' roles. I got... A few contacts from some good academies, actually, but I was determined I didn't want to go back into straight away um, yeah. academy football and felt like I needed more experience of, of full-time football. And I was fortunate enough to be contacted by um, the Grimsby manager at the time, Michael Jolly, um, who I'd sort of known through academy football. He was the Burnley under-23s manager. He, he'd done the pro license, I think, a little bit before me, so we'd come across each other. I saw him do a really good presentation on the pro license, and we sort of kept in touch through that loosely and he needed an assistant manager he wanted someone who was on the same sort of um wavelength as him he'd been a young manager a young coach he wanted to develop players and he needed some enthusiasm some um and someone who was good on the grass so we spoke in the summer and i decided to make the move as assistant manager there it was i thought it was a good one because it was league two football so it was in the football league it was the league above where i'd managed before although it wasn't a manager's job I felt like this was a manager that I could work with and really we shared the same ideas and philosophy and that was really important to me. I wasn't just going to go in and work for anyone. I wanted to make sure it was the right move. And I was quite um, uh, pleased that that happened straight away. Um, I'd left my job there in April and then back by sort of the off season in May, I was, I was back in and looking forward to the Football League season. And it was, it was a step up in terms of um, the level. Um, people say the levels are close but I think they're quite far apart I think the best teams in League 2 are, are far above the National League teams I think there's some good National League teams who could, would compete in League 2 but yeah. I think that it's, it's, it's a good a good level jump and, and there's some really good players and good good managers in the Football League so yeah I went in as the assistant manager there and and um, yeah it was good good great club amazing club still there now obviously as the assistant manager um, we had one and a bit seasons there. We finished um, 18th in the first season, so it wasn't in a relegation fight. Like The team only just stayed up the year before. We felt like we showed improvements there. We gave a lot of young players their debuts and starting in the team and brought them through, so that was good. And then in the second season, which was this season, um, Michael unfortunately lost his job. I assumed that I'd be then going with him because i come in with him. So I thought, okay, right, I'll end up having Christmas uh, back in London with the family. This will be lovely. Um, have a bit of time off to regroup and then go again. But I ended up um, being asked to be put in caretaker charge, um, which was quite a shock to me, really. And it was difficult because I obviously had a lot of um, respect for Michael and he's the one who brought me in. So I was very loyal to him and was the whole time. So I was quite shocked that I um, was offered that job. Um, he was very supportive in that, though, and understood sort of the job and how it worked. I had a contract at the time, so I couldn't resign and ended up wanting to try and do the best job I could there. So I was caretaker for about eight or nine games. Um, I think we drew too many games in that time. We probably drew about four games. And then Ian Holloway came in as the manager and he kept me on as his assistant. So Grimsby's been, yeah, a bit of a quick and a bit of a crazy whirlwind of a, a role. I've obviously worked with two totally different managers now to work with someone like Ian Holloway, who's got two teams promoted into the Premier League and with a wealth of experience. But then also to learn off someone like Michael Jolly, who's a very clever guy, good experience in the Football League, was two totally opposites. But then also in the middle to have that experience of me taking over the team and possibly having a, a, a shot at being the manager was a really good experience too. Um, I mean, in terms of the club Grimsby, it's an absolute sleeping giant. The place is crazy for football. It's a great place. They're absolute nuts for the game. The fans are unbelievable. I've never seen fans like it at any of the clubs I've been at. It's the support they've got for the players and the, the people who work there is just amazing. The whole town's crazy about the football club and it's been a great place to work so far and, and still there now and obviously we're in this strange um, situation with what's going on at the moment with no football and football's probably the least of everybody's worries at the moment and so it should be if your family and, and everyone being safe is, is the most important. But it's also allowed me a little bit more time just to sort of sit back and have a forced break and evaluate again. I found these times when you're out of work or not actually being forced to work, which is now is really important to, to, to do that. So yeah, trying to learn the lessons from that sort of little Grimsby experience and, and go again. 
Yeah, sounds good. And so kind of picking up on a, on a few bits then. So obviously, number one, I think like you just mentioned there about the, the Grimsby Town fan, that's, that's massive as well. Like you said uh, about previous roles that you've taken, you've taken it not just based on the opportunity that may be there, but also the right opportunity. Um, and I think that, you know, someone, some, a town like Grimsby, where like you said, um, you know, the football is crazy for them there and, and you know, they're really involved within it not only is that good from a town's point of view, but it's also good from your, your own point of view as well, because you know, you're going into an environment, going, going back into the early coaching modules of, you know, creating the right environment, an environment yeah, which is allowing you to develop as well and, and uh, you know, going down that route. Um, and then also as well, kind of touching on the sort of um, aspect of, you said, obviously uh, learning from Michael and then now obviously learning from Ian Holloway as well. Again, getting to learn from different people. Like you said, they're probably at two different stages of their journeys. Um, although sharing obviously you know the similar roles in which they have had and, yeah. and now have um but again it's, it's i think yeah it's, that goes back to that thing of learning from people and taking information onto the, again it must be you know a great learning experience from yourself from like you said going from assistant to caretaker and then now obviously going to assistant again but again taking different experiences from a different individual um so yeah it must be massive yeah, that, yeah. um so kind of going on a sort of whole then um obviously incredible journey in terms of like you said not even starting in England really starting over in Australia and then coming mm -hmm. over and then and, and as to where you are now and I think it's a bit of a uh, cliche question and a very broad question really but similar to like how they say with footballers you know what does it take for a footballer to make it what would you say for a coach so I mean a lot of these coaches like I said are kind of in these environments where they're working yeah. within schools they, they are highly ambitious but then they kind of don't see no no vision past the schools because they think, well, I don't know if I'm going to get an opportunity or how do I do that? What would, what would your advice be yeah. for them? Well, I just think I, I was always, um, I'm not sure why, why I thought this way early on, but I thought I've got to spend as much time on the grass coaching at any level I could as much as I can. So I get a lot of emails and a lot of people say, oh, come on, come in and watch or who should I go and watch coach and who should, and, and that's good as well. You need to go and watch good people work and be in touch with people. And, but I think the best, or I just found for me, the best thing was just getting as many hours as I could under the belt, whether that be like girls football, school football, after school clubs, senior men's, good players, not so good players. And, and I just went out, if, I think if you sat down, you added up your actual coaching hours in your career. So if you worked out at each job you've had, how many actual hours are you on the grass delivering and coaching? I think people's would be varied. So people say they want to be a professional football coach, but they're only delivering four hours on the grass a week, but they're watching 20 hours of videos and then they're going and watching three teams work. You've got to be doing 20 hours of coaching plus yourself, I think in the early stages. Until then, you do so many sessions that you build up. I mean, I've still got practices I'm using now with Grimsby that I've built up over 10 years of working with them from when I was back at Wingate and Finchley in the Roman Division 1 North. And I've changed them and adapt them and depend on the players and the size and the age group and that I've built all the way and still using things now that I've used back then. So I always felt that time on the grass of actual delivering and coaching was so important. And also like delivering in like meetings, team meetings, video taking lectures, things like that. So I, w I was more of more doing and less sort of talking about it. And don't be a, I always said, don't be a computer coach. I'm not the best on yeah. computers. Maybe that's showing my age here, but actually going and really delivering on the grass would be my one big sort of take home point that I've just found worked well with me yeah. um, that, that I found to be really important. And of course, you've got to be like a good reader. You've got to study. If you've never played the game, and you don't have that playing experience to fall back on and use those experiences, which if you've played at the highest level, you, you, you've definitely got an advantage over people who haven't played at the highest level. So it's, it's, it's always the case of that. But I think that if you haven't done that, you've got to be a better communicator. You've got to win the players over in a different way by delivering good sessions, by getting to know them, by understanding the game and really be knowing your stuff. And I think if you can prove that you can do that, and how do you do that? You do that by delivering and gaining the experience with it. So I think couple those things together, that would be my big take home points. And just, yeah, you just never give up. You've just got to keep going. And you, you never know, like I think you said before, you never know when the next opportunity is around the corner. It can just quickly change like that in terms of a coach, just like as a player, you get a move, someone sees you. You never know who's watching your coach or deliver at any time. So I think that'd be really important is those, those probably three things. Delivery on the grass, make sure you get in a, a variety of, sessions and and that sort of thing in with different age groups and treat every session as good as what it is as if you're working with the top players and then also yeah just keep going and never giving up and working hard
yeah no it makes total sense and um yeah i agree i think it's putting in those practice within the hours of what you're doing and like you said that that self-learning massively important um anthony massive massive thank you for uh joining us on today um i think like i said an incredible journey which isn't over yet um by by far it's not yeah. over yet um no, and, hopefully um, not <laughs> Many more years to go yeah. um and obviously it's a great insight in terms of um the advice just given there um and also you know that just like a footballer a coach's journey is, is going to have ups and downs and it's about being brave and and, and, and taking those risks and, and, and facing up against them so yeah massive thank you for having you on here um i said really, really do, do, do appreciate you taking the time um and i'm sure a lot of coaches are going to benefit from this um and taking things away from thank you very much